The Fortunes of Sir Robert Ardagh by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Fortunes of Sir Robert Ardagh. In the south of Ireland, and on the borders of the county of Limerick, there lies a district of two or three miles in length, which is rendered interesting by the fact that it is one of the very few spots throughout this country in which some vestige of aboriginal forests still remain. It has little or none of the lordly character of the American forest, for the axe has felled its oldest and its grandest trees but in the close wood which survives live all the wild and pleasing peculiarities of nature its complete irregularity its vistas in whose perspective the quiet cattle are browsing its refreshing glades where the grey rocks arise from amid the nodding fern the silvery shafts of the old birch trees the knotted trunks of the hoary oak the grotesque but graceful branches which never shed their honours under the tyrant pruning hook, the soft green sward, the chequered light and shade, the wild luxuriant weeds, the lichen and the moss, are all beautiful alike in the green freshness of spring or in the sadness and sere of autumn. Their beauty is of that kind which makes the heart full with joy, appealing to the affections with a power which belongs to nature only. This wood runs up from below the base to the ridge of a long line of irregular hills, having perhaps, in primitive times, formed but the skirting of some mighty forest which occupied the level below. But now, alas, whither have we drifted? Whither has the tide of civilization borne us? It has passed over a land unprepared for it. It has left nakedness behind it. We have lost our forests, but our marauders remain. We have destroyed all that is picturesque, while we have retained everything that is revolting in barbarism. Through the midst of this woodland there runs a deep gully or glen, where the stillness of the scene is broken in upon by the brawling of a mountain stream, which, however, in the winter season, swells into a rapid and formidable torrent. There is one point at which the glen becomes extremely deep and narrow. The sides descend to the depth of some hundred feet, and are so steep as to be nearly perpendicular. The wild trees which have taken root in the crannies and chasm of the rock are so intersected and entangled that one can with difficulty catch a glimpse of the stream which wheels, flashes, and foams below as if exulting in the surrounding silence and solitude this spot was not unwisely chosen as a point of no ordinary strength for the erection of a massive square tower or keep one side of which rises as if in continuation of the precipitous cliff on which it is based originally the only mode of ingress was by a narrow portal in the very wall which overtopped the precipice opening upon a ledge of rock which afforded a precarious pathway cautiously intersected however by a deep trench cut out with great labour in the living rock so that in its pristine state and before the introduction of artillery into the art of war this tower might have been pronounced and that not presumptuously impregnable the progress of improvement and the increasing security of the times had however tempted its successive proprietors if not to adorn at least to enlarge their premises and about the middle of the last century when the castle was last inhabited the original square tower formed but a small part of the edifice the castle and a wide tract of the surrounding country had from time immemorial belonged to a family which for distinctness we shall call by the name of ardagh and owing to the associations which in ireland almost always attached to scenes 
which have long witnessed alike the exercise of stern feudal authority and of that savage hospitality which distinguished the good old times this building has become the subject and the scene of many wild and extraordinary traditions one of them i have been enabled by a personal acquaintance with an eye-witness of the events to trace to its origin and yet it is hard to say whether the events which i am about to record appear more strange and improbable as seen through the distorting medium of tradition or in the appalling dimness of uncertainty which surrounds the reality tradition says that sometime in the last century sir robert ardagh a young man and the last heir of that family went abroad and served in foreign armies and that having acquired considerable honour and emolument he settled at castle ardagh the building we have just now attempted to describe he was what the country people call a dark man that is he was considered morose reserved and ill-tempered and as it was supposed from the utter solitude of his life was upon no terms of cordiality with the other members of his family the only occasion upon which he broke through the solitary monotony of his life was during the continuance of the racing season and immediately subsequent to it at which time he was to be seen among the busiest upon the course betting deeply and unhesitatingly and invariably with success sir robert was however too well known as a man of honour and of too high a family to be suspected of any unfair dealing he was moreover a soldier and a man of intrepid as well as of a haughty character and no one cared to hazard a surmise the consequences of which would be felt most probably by its originator only gossip however was not silent it was remarked that sir robert never appeared at the race ground which was the only place of public resort which he frequented except in company with a certain strange-looking person who was never seen elsewhere or under other circumstances it was remarked too that this man whose relation to sir robert was never distinctly ascertained was the only person to whom he seemed to speak unnecessarily it was observed that while with the country gentry he exchanged no further communication than what was unavoidable in arranging his sporting transactions with this person he would converse earnestly and frequently tradition asserts that to enhance the curiosity which this unaccountable and exclusive preference excited the stranger possessed some striking and unpleasant peculiarities of person and of garb though it is not stated however what these were but they in conjunction with sir robert's secluded habits an extraordinary run of luck a success which was supposed to result from the suggestions and immediate advice of the unknown were sufficient to warrant report in pronouncing that there was something queer in the wind and in surmising that sir robert was playing a fearful and a hazardous game and that in short his strange companion was little better than the devil himself years rolled quietly away and nothing very novel occurred in the arrangements of castle ardagh excepting that sir robert parted with his odd companion but as nobody could tell whence he came so nobody could say whither he had gone sir robert's habits however underwent no consequent change he continued regularly to frequent the race meetings without mixing at all in the convivialities of the gentry and immediately afterwards to relapse into the secluded monotony of his ordinary life it was said that he had accumulated vast sums of money and as his bets were always successful and always large such must have been the case he did not suffer the acquisition of wealth however to influence his hospitality or his housekeeping he neither purchased land nor extended his establishment and his mode of enjoying his money must have been altogether that of the miser consisting merely in the pleasure of touching and telling his gold 
and in the consciousness of wealth sir robert's temper so far from improving became more than ever gloomy and morose he sometimes carried the indulgence of his evil dispositions to such a height that it bordered upon insanity during these paroxysms he would neither eat drink nor sleep on such occasions he insisted on perfect privacy even from the intrusion of his most trusted servants his voice was frequently heard sometimes in earnest supplication sometimes raised as if in loud and angry altercation with some unknown visitant sometimes he would for hours together walk to and fro throughout the long oak wainscoted apartment which he generally occupied with wild gesticulations and agitated pace in the manner of one who has been roused to a state of unnatural excitement by some sudden and appalling intimation these paroxysms of apparent lunacy were so frightful that during their continuance even his oldest and most faithful domestics dared not approach him consequently his hours of agony were never intruded upon and the mysterious causes of his sufferings appeared likely to remain hidden for ever on one occasion a fit of this kind continued for an unusual time the ordinary term of their duration about two days had been long past and the old servant who generally waited upon sir robert after these visitations having in vain listened for the well-known tinkle of his master's handbell began to feel extremely anxious he feared that his master might have died from sheer exhaustion or perhaps put an end to his own existence during his miserable depression these fears at length became so strong that having in vain urged some of his brother servants to accompany him he determined to go up alone and himself see whether any accident had befallen sir robert he traversed the several passages which conducted from the new to the more ancient parts of the mansion and having arrived in the old hall of the castle the utter silence of the hour for it was very late in the night the idea of the nature of the enterprise in which he was engaging himself a sensation of remoteness from anything like human companionship but more than all the vivid but undefined anticipation of something horrible came upon him with such oppressive weight that he hesitated as to whether he should proceed real uneasiness however respecting the fate of his master for whom he felt that kind of attachment which the force of habitual intercourse not unfrequently engenders respecting objects not in themselves amiable and also a latent unwillingness to expose his weakness to the ridicule of his fellow-servants combined to overcome his reluctance and he had just placed his foot upon the first step of the staircase which conducted to his master's chamber when his attention was arrested by a low but distinct knocking at the hall door not perhaps very sorry at finding thus an excuse even for deferring his intended expedition he placed the candle upon a stone block which lay in the hall and approached the door uncertain whether his ears had not deceived him this doubt was justified by the circumstance that the hall entrance had been for nearly fifty years disused as a mode of ingress to the castle the situation of this gate also which we have endeavoured to describe opening upon a narrow ledge of rock which overhangs a perilous cliff rendered it at all times but particularly at night a dangerous entrance this shelving platform of rock which formed the only avenue to the door was divided as i have already stated by a broad chasm the plank across which had long disappeared by decay or otherwise so that it seemed at least highly improbable that any man could have found his way across the passage in safety to the door more particularly on a night like this of singular darkness the old man therefore listened attentively to ascertain whether the first application should be followed by another 
He had not long to wait. The same low but singularly distinct knocking was repeated, so low that it seemed as if the applicant had employed no harder or heavier instrument than his hand, and yet, despite the immense thickness of the door, with such strength that the sound was distinctly audible. The knock was repeated a third time without any increase of loudness, and the old man, obeying an impulse for which to his dying hour he could never account, proceeded to remove one by one the three great oaken bars which secured the door. Time and damp had effectually corroded the iron chambers of the lock, so that it afforded little resistance. With some effort, as he believed, assisted from without, the old servant succeeded in opening the door, and a low square-built figure, apparently that of a man wrapped in a large black cloak, entered the hall. The servant could not see much of this visitor with any distinctness. His dress appeared foreign, the skirt of his ample cloak was thrown over one shoulder, he wore a large felt hat with a very heavy leaf from under which escaped what appeared to be a mass of long sooty black hair. His feet were cased in heavy riding boots. Such were the few particulars which the servant had time and light to observe. The stranger desired him to let his master know instantly that the friend had come, by appointment, to settle some business with him. The servant hesitated, but a slight motion on the part of his visitor, as if to possess himself of the candle, determined him. So, taking it in his hand, he ascended the castle stairs, leaving the guest in the hall. On reaching the apartment which opened upon the oak chamber, he was surprised to observe the door of that room partly open, and the room itself lit up. He paused, but there was no sound. He looked in, and saw Sir Robert his head and the upper part of his body reclining on a table, upon which two candles burned. His arms were stretched forward on either side, and perfectly motionless. It appeared that, having been sitting at the table, he had thus sunk forward, either dead or in a swoon. There was no sound of breathing. All was silent, except the sharp ticking of a watch, which lay beside the lamp. The servant coughed twice or thrice, but with no effect. His fears now almost amounted to certainty, and he was approaching the table on which his master partly lay to satisfy himself of his death, when Sir Robert slowly raised his head, and throwing himself back in his chair, fixed his eyes in a ghastly and uncertain gaze upon his attendant. At length he said slowly and painfully, as if he dreaded the answer, in god's name what are you sir said the servant a strange gentleman wants to see you below at this intimation sir robert starting to his feet and tossing his arms widely upwards uttered a shriek of such appalling and despairing terror that it was almost too fearful for human endurance and long after the sound had ceased it seemed to the terrified imagination of the old servant to roll through the deserted passages in bursts of unnatural laughter after a few moments sir robert said can't you send him away why does he come so soon o oh, merciful powers let him leave me for an hour a little time i can't see him now try to get him away you see i can't go down now I have not strength. O oh God, O oh God, let him come back in an hour. It is not long to wait. He cannot lose anything by it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Tell him that. Say anything to him. The servant went down. In his own words, he did not feel the stairs under him till he got to the hall. The figure stood exactly as he had left it. He delivered his master's message as coherently as he could. The stranger replied in a careless tone, If Sir Robert will not come down to me, I must go up to him. The man returned, and to his surprise he found his master much more composed in manner. He listened to the message, and though the cold perspiration rose in drops upon his forehead faster than he could wipe it away, 
His manner had lost the dreadful agitation which had marked it before. He rose feebly, and casting a last look of agony behind him, passed from the room to the lobby, where he signed to his attendant not to follow him. The man moved as far as the head of the staircase, from whence he had a tolerably distinct view of the hall, which was imperfectly lighted by the candle he had left there. He saw his master reel rather than walk down the stairs, clinging all the way to the banisters. He walked on as if about to sink every moment from weakness. The figure advanced as if to meet him, and in passing struck down the light. The servant could see no more, but there was a sound of struggling, renewed at intervals with silent but fearful energy. It was evident, however, that the parties were approaching the door, for he heard the solid oak sound twice or thrice, as the feet of the combatants, in shuffling hither and thither over the floor, struck upon it. After a slight pause, he heard the door thrown open with such violence that the leaf seemed to strike the side wall of the hall, for it was so dark without that this could only be surmised by the sound. The struggle was renewed with an agony and intenseness of energy that betrayed itself in deep-drawn gasps. One desperate effort, which terminated in the breaking of some part of the door, producing a sound as if the doorpost was wrenched from its position, was followed by another wrestle, evidently upon the narrow ledge which ran outside the door, overtopping the precipice. This proved to be the final struggle. It was followed by a crashing sound, as if some heavy body had fallen over, and was rushing down the precipice through the light bows that crossed near the top. All then became still as the grave, except when the moon of the night wind sighed up the wooden glen. The old servant had not nerve to return through the hall, and to him the darkness seemed all but endless. But morning at length came, and with it the disclosure of the events of the night. Near the door upon the ground lay Sir Robert's sword-belt, which had given way in the scuffle. The huge splinter from the massive door-post had been wrenched off by an almost superhuman effort, one which nothing but the gripe of a despairing man could have severed, and on the rocks outside were left the marks of the slipping and sliding of feet. At the foot of the precipice, not immediately under the castle, but dragged some way up the glen, were found the remains of Sir Robert, with hardly a vestige of a limb or feature left distinguishable. The right hand, however, was uninjured, and in its fingers were clutched with the fixedness of death, a long lock of coarse sooty hair, the only direct circumstantial evidence of the presence of a second person. End of the Fortunes of Sir Robert Ardag by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. Read by Lars Rolander.